Hello, everybody. Um, my name is JP. I work at the Federal District Court for the District of Oregon in a uh, sort of more application administration capacity than an actual legal capacity, although I do still draft uh, some procedures and rules and whatnot for the district here. Um, there's an actual real lawyer in the back of the room. Paula Holm Jensen is here as well, um, and she was a speaker earlier at this very conference. So if we have any particularly tricky questions, we're going to punt. Um, and the topic is Bitcoin, and what are the regulatory frameworks going to do about it? Um, do we need new regulatory frameworks? Uh, what do you, as a possible Bitcoin user and or developer of things around Bitcoin and or person who just wants to sell your stuff and accept Bitcoin, uh, have to worry about uh, now? And of course, by tomorrow, it'll be different. Um, one of the things that really strikes me about Bitcoin is that it is moving very quickly uh, forward this notion that digital currency is something that is just should already have happened. We're already used to digital transactions in a lot of ways. We just use different mechanisms and different payment gateways to, to do them now. Um, Bitcoin, I think, has gotten a lot of traction for people who especially like frictionless systems, you know, systems that don't require this central clearinghouse to go, yes, this is valid, go ahead and pay it, or to, you know, create that kind of payment gateway mechanism. It's it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's entirely decentralized, and it allows users to authenticate between themselves to make those kinds of payments. And so Pratchett's quote, and this book generally, is just a really sort of funny intro into this mechanism of, of what happens when our expectations about money shift quicker than we're, we're used to them shifting. What we're not doing is providing definitive answers to that question. Um, there is, there's just, there's literally too much going on. And in fact, you know, even as we speak, there are people appearing you know, on Capitol Hill yesterday from the Bitcoin Foundation to try and say, no, we're not evil money launderers, and yes, you should regulate us, but tell us what you're doing, and you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of gray area right now. Um, I anticipate that a lot of you, and especially Don P. Don P. here in the front, know a lot more about the technical aspects of Bitcoin than I do, and so if there are any questions surrounding that, we'll probably throw those to the, to the wider group and, uh, and kind of just see what kind of answers we can come up with. Um, and also, obviously, we are never ensuring that you're not going to get sued, you're not going to get investigated, you're not going to get like audited by the IRS or any of those kinds of things. It can happen to the most law-abiding citizens, let alone people who are uh, perhaps working in gray areas. And so, um, you know, it, is, it just is what it is. When lawyers think about legal risk, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I did these slides last Monday, I apologize. Um, we are at least going to try to get a handle on what's going on um, and at the federal level and also in terms of uh, you know, what, are, what are some possible regulations and leg legislations that are gonna occur as a result. Develop just some basic good practices to employ if you're gonna be somebody who uses Bitcoin or accepts Bitcoin as payment for goods or services. Um, hopefully make some future looking assumptions that don't look totally stupid in a year and uh, answer any questions that I can. Again, we're going we're gonna to lean on Paula and Don for technical and or super hyper legal stuff. Um, so now when lawyers talk about risk, they tend to say that no risk is the best risk. So lawyers live on the belt and suspenders end of the of the spectrum. Not only do you have a belt on, but you're also holding your pants up with suspenders. And obviously you get to the other end of the spectrum and you just don't even have any pants and maybe don't know where they are. Um, <laughs> this, the, the idea that you're going to be able to avoid all risks in, in any kind of environment, whether it's a business environment or a, or a legal environment, is, is just pretty foolish. And so what tends to happen, especially when we think about you know, how we manage risk in our everyday life is we, we operate somewhere within the middle of that spectrum, even if we don't know that's true or not. Like we send our credit card, you know, in what we think is an encrypted tr transaction, but the Wi-Fi is just in the clear or whatever, you know. And so it's like, okay, sure, yeah, that was not risky. Um, there's obviously full-on illegal things you can do with money, like going onto Silk Road and buying drugs and having them shipped to your home. You can not trust any of this and 
you know, hide from the evil systems of the world and just try to live a very simple life where none of this ever touches you. And that's kind of as far away from no risk as you can get when you're talking about actually having transactions with human beings. Um, so then we take that spectrum of risk and we add to it ease of use. And ease of use becomes something that makes Bitcoin really attractive. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of electronic transaction mechanisms have become super cool over the past little while because it's like swipe the card, you're done. You know, you walk into Starbucks, you show them your little gold thing, it's you're done. You, uh, you know, swipe your Supportland card and get points for, you know, buying at this retailer that you can redeem for another retailer. This, all this whole mechanism of tracking your behavior. Uh, somebody, I was at a talk once, who, somebody said that we're in a golden age of shopping. You know, it has never been, it's never been easier to shop. It's never been easier for retailers to tell you what you should buy based on what you have shopped for. Yeah, you know, exactly, right? Like, you're, you know, you're in this wonderful, like, I have this tablet that tells me what to get and, you know, gives me recommendations. I walk into Starbucks and it tells me what to put on the tablet. Where's my little card? I just got one today. Anyway, um, so high ease of use, low risk is really what we're looking for as far as the best practice goes when we're trying to secure ourselves against you know this sort of regulatory environment that might bite us in the butt what we really want to do is we want to leverage how easy it is to use something like bitcoin or any sort of system but also keep us relatively safe corporate america lives a little below that line where it's kind of low ease of use but still low risk and that's where you get into these sort of you know double column accounting and triple protected audit systems and you know all the sort of mechanisms of how we do business and I certainly work at a place that has you know some pretty extreme focuses on uh, you know where's the money going you know uh, and and how are we utilizing it and who checked that we were utilizing it appropriately and who checked the person who checked it and then who checked the report of the person who checked the person who, you know et cetera, et cetera. so it's kludgy but it works it keeps us safe um, Fast and loose is, you know, maybe a little bit easy, but also a little bit more risky. Um, you know, those, it, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But if you're trying to run a business or you're, you're basing a substantial part of your income or your, uh, you know, your legal security, say, for example, when you're filing your taxes uh, on, on the outcomes of those methods, you may or may not discover that uh, it hasn't worked out too well, or when the audit questions come around, you, you have some difficult questions to answer, and you can't, you maybe didn't have a process that protected you from a particular, uh, a particular legal risk. And then just plain stupid is high risk and hard to do, right? I mean, uh, why, why, don't be stupid. Why, <laughs> if, I can, if I can encourage you to do anything, it is, it is please, please don't be stupid. There's, there's no reason to, to create a system that is complicated and also doesn't protect you from, from any of the things that you're trying to protect yourself from. That's just, it's, you, that's, a, that's a super fail. It's like are these fans all left early from the Miami Heat game last night, I guess. This was some sort of internet sensation. And so it's game six, they're you know, four points down, there's 53 seconds to go, which in basketball is like an hour and a half. Um, and, the, and all the fans started bailing out of the auditorium and then they tied it and then they got into overtime and the fans realized on the way to their cars that it was happening and they tried to get back into the building and they're doing, don't be stupid, you know. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. One, one very quick slide on Bitcoin. It is, as I said, decentralized. It does not have a central authority. It does not have a, a nation state or a central bank backing it up and verifying the transactions, ensuring the value of the thing itself. Um, none of that exists. The blockchain is the thing that guarantees both the value of the thing you're trading and the security of that transaction and the existence of the coins and that they're not being double spent, all that kind of stuff. Doesn't rely on you know, any sort of payment gateway whatsoever. I could give Don a Bitcoin right now. Um, there's no borders because of that, right? Almost every other currency that has ever gotten this level of attention has been, you know, respective to a nation state or a collection of nation states like the euro. A Bitcoin can come from Bangladesh into my account just as effectively as it can come from Don, you know? And so, and the, the matrix by which that transaction is made is also international. So from a legal standpoint, you start talking about multiple jurisdictions, you immediately get extraordinarily twitchy. Um, so it's, it's something to 
pay, keep in mind. Peer-to-peer, -peer, as I've just said, and then encrypted, which in itself gives you some sense of security, at least around the transaction. And I don't mean for this to be a talk where you walk away and go, oh my god, I'm never touching that stuff. It is, it, it's no different than any other sort of barter mechanism or exchange of one thing for another thing. Um, but there are some additional issues that you might have to face depending on what you're doing. So people are starting to talk about it, obviously. And some people are saying, oh, you know, it is. It's like Supportland, or it's like if you ever came from a neighborhood or a, or a city that had like Brooklyn Bucks or something like that, where the idea was to keep local dollars in the local economy. And so you could exchange some amount of your money for script that was accepted at retailers, or you could do volunteer work and get script that you could use to purchase goods and services within, lo within the local community. So Kaplanov, in a, in a law review article from early last year, says, no, none of this. They don't fall under these big, scary provisions. They're not a bank. They're not a money transmitter. They're not, if this isn't trading in a, some sort of short-term, you know, cash product or bond or anything like that, like, it's fine. It's just, it's community money. It's just the community happens to be the whole planet. Um, <laughs> other people? maybe a little less happy about the prospect of that. Um, and this was from a, you know, the, the article was, was a broader look at the kind of ways that the internet makes regulation a huge pain in the ass and is essentially anti-state. Um, and says, quite simply, there's no way to regulate this stuff. God only knows what people are using it for. And the, you know, oh my God, we're doomed. Uh, I, I, I tend to fall on the one more, the former rather than the latter, but, but um, nobody quite knows what to do with it. However, the current regulatory schema are in fact insufficient. There's been this running uh, debate among legal scholars about whether or not the law of the internet needs to be different than the law of everything else that we've done in the past this may finally be the one that breaks the law of the horse's back. Um, this may be the one where we're finally unable to have a successful metaphor for this kind of transaction. We might actually need a whole new way uh, to look at it, um, which is why there's a whole lot of attention being paid on how to regulate digital currencies, uh, virtual currencies, even you know, like World of Warcraft gold, stuff like that, is starting to get attention from the IRS because people are beginning to understand that substantial economic activity is occurring in places that are not, that we can't, that doesn't translate into the current, into the cur current state. So unfortunately, as I said in the beginning too, a lot of watch this space, a lot of we don't know what's going to happen or how the government is going to fall one way or the other uh, in terms of trying to regulate this. Um, Senator, Char Senator Charles Schumer just said it should be illegal. So this is a money laundering scheme. This is just people pumping money into some sort of secret system, and then it comes out somewhere else, and it's you know squeaky clean because it's been through this digital transaction. And these people are all just you know this is like kitty porn and people selling stuff for you know Silk Road and blah, 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 and um, um, uh, not perhaps the most productive means of uh, handling the the situation. <coughs> However, I, I think it is maybe typical of Congress. Uh, so, so in terms of actual legislation, luckily, well, I, I, I'm biased, but <laughs> fortunately, we haven't seen a lot of stuff actually occurring uh, in the in the legislatures yet around. Okay, so how do we make it illegal then? Uh, which I, I I think is a good thing. Um, the General Accounting Accountability Office, sorry, uh, for the U.S. government, just uh, issued a report to Congress saying that the IRS needed to create some stronger language around Bitcoin and virtual currencies being income or being money or that you have to report it or that there are you know, aspects to your taxes that will be implicated if you're buying and selling services using Bitcoins or if you have a lot of Bitcoins that you mined when this was just kind of a funny experiment and now they're you know, trading at $150, $200 or whatever. I mean, all of these kinds of issues, uh, it, it, it is and it isn't a good report. Yes, the IRS needs to issue some guidelines, but the, if there's one thing I can impress upon you in, from this talk, it is that income is income from whatever source derived. Al Capone didn't go to jail because he was doing a lot of criminal stuff. He went to jail because he didn't report the proceeds of the criminal stuff on his taxes to the IRS. 
there is there is a very few exceptions, and and the and the code is very clear. It's it's section sixty one, I think, and it just says you know gross income, which is the number you start with before you start doing all your deductions and all your other fun stuff, is whatever the hell you made. We don't care how you made it. We don't care if you traded for oranges and avocados. We don't care if you um, exchanged services and uh, some sort of barter agreement with somebody. We don't. We just don't care. If you made money in some fashion, whether, you know, however you translate that money, uh, you have to declare it as income. So on the one hand, yes, obviously the IRS could do better at making that more broadly known, but, you know, the, the tax code is extraordinarily clear, and I don't know that they would need to add regulations or guidelines to that. Um, the big one is when the Treasury Department said that particularly if you are something like an empty gox or a, 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 a Bitcoin clearing house of any type. Maybe you offer a wallet service or you um, have some like cash register uh, checkout widget that immediately converts like a US dollar value product into Bitcoins and then you know, gives the, gives the seller dollars for the buyer's Bitcoin and retains the Bitcoin for your own use or whatever. Any, any sort of mechanism by which you become more than just a guy with some Bitcoins or a girl with some Bitcoins, uh, you are going to have to comply to a fairly uh, weighty set of regulations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the fundamental aspect of it is, you know, you're, you're on the hook for being able to report kind of not only your activities, but to the extent that it's possible, the activities of the people who have used your service. And you have to register yourself as a money transmitter uh, in all of the contiguous United States. So um, Bitcoin 2013, which just happened about a month ago, uh, was a lot about, holy crap, what do we do to comply uh, with that law, because if we're going to be treated as money transmitters, as developers, not as just Joe Schmo or Jill Schmo with a with some bitcoins and a, and an interest in purchasing a comic book um, or hosting services or whatever, but actual folks who are working within this space to create some development tools or to hook into uh, Bitcoin as a service um, are are going to have to start thinking very closely about that. So we're just going to talk briefly about some scenarios. I didn't want to ramble at you for very long, so then I'd really like to open it up to just questions and discussions once we get to the end of these. But again, the following, all of the rest of these slides pretty much assume some basic truths. Income is income. If you, if you sold a thing with Bitcoins, that is, that is reportable on your taxes. If you uh, saw an appreciation in your Bitcoin stash and then sold that Bitcoin stash, as far as I can tell, you're on the hook for capital gains around the, the difference in the, in the purchase price and the sale price of that good, which makes it a little complicated. And that is maybe where the IRS could help out and provide some guidelines around, like, what, how, do you, how do you treat this money that's fluctuating wildly? Like, if you got paid in euros and there was a slight change, then, you know, whatever. But, I mean, <laughs> Bitcoin does, does some much bigger jumps, and so we, we do need to figure out uh, how, we, how we effectively account for that when we're, when we're reporting on our taxes. As I said, contract law thinks that if you think that, you know, this has value and I think that this has value and we think they have roughly the same value and we want to trade them, then we're good. You know, contract and transactional law generally does not question an individual's ability to consider something worth their time or their thing or whatever it is. So if I exchange my thing for your thing, that is a valid contract. So if you're offering something for sale and you accept Bitcoins, that isn't, you know, you're not doing something illegal. You're not doing something weird and you're not defrauding the person who purchases that, um, you know, good or service unless there's something else going on with the contract. But what, I mean, the bare bones, like, Let's, let's buy some stuff with Bitcoins or let's sell some stuff for Bitcoins. All of that is, is perfectly acceptable. And, you know, unless there are other sort of funky things uh, going on with the, with the contract, you can assume that that's, uh, you know, a fair exchange uh, for value. And then, like I said above, adjusting for currency volatility has got to be a pain in the butt. I mean, I think if you're selling a, you know, you're a webcomic artist, which is our first example, and you're selling prints or t-shirts or, you know, physical books of the compiled webcomic, 
you know, on your little shop and you say, I'll accept Bitcoins, you, one of your first questions has to be, all right, so this is a 9.99 item. What do I charge in Bitcoins? I mean, it, one day it might be a, a two tenths of a coin. It might, another day it might be, you know, more than that or less than that or something like that. And so, so for Josephine's example, um, you know, it might make sense for actual graphic design clients or people who are on, you know, sort of a bigger scale. It might make sense to have Bitcoin as a payment option or as an installment option or something like that for a couple of reasons. One, you're minimize this is just this is doesn't have anything to do with the law it's just common sense that if you're accepting you know sort of periodic payments in a currency that is very wildly fluctuating you're going to end up somewhere near the average of what it's worth over time so if you have an annual contract with somebody or if you have an installment system or something like that or you're on retainer uh, it's it's maybe easier to fathom both the business and the legal risks if you can say all right, the value of, of this thing is this much, and however many Bitcoins that takes each month, that's what you pay me. And we, and we move along like that. You know, I mentioned the, the uh, shopping cart plugin because somebody is going to have to create the shopping cart plugin that can convert Bitcoins on the fly based on, you know, maybe the three major exchanges or something like that. Because otherwise, if you're just trying to sell your poster or you're just trying to sell, you know, a T-shirt, I... I I'm not entirely sure it's worth the hassle of figuring out how to make that conversion moment happen every single time. And then from a tax perspective, the nice thing for Josephine is that, you know, I would treat each one of those as a 9.99 sale. If you if you solve the technical problem, then then fine. Look, I sold 10 shirts for 10 bucks, it doesn't matter if they gave me dollars or if they gave me you know, PayPal dollars, which are strictly speaking not quite dollars, depending on who's doing the arbitrage, or they gave me bitcoins, like, you know, bada bing, bada bing, bada bing. My accounting is relatively simple, so long as I can figure out that, that technical hurdle. Um, and I think that's about all I had to say about Josephine. The, the sort of, well, we scale up over time, and sort of the bigger you get, the more concerns you have because the more attention is going to be paid to you by various, you know, all the, all the things that you do. Um, so, for example, a software as a service company. Uh, Widget Bomb is um, creating a subscription model that allows people to track analytics in their, in their apps. And they have a series of subscription levels and they also have just a report product that lets, you know, like they, they run, you know, some sort of thing on your on the you know subscriber base of your of your app and they and they find out what it is and so they'll sell that to you for 55 bucks like one time this is what your users are doing this is what they're clicking on this is what they aren't this is where they're visiting blah 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 whatever it is um, again we're back to that dilemma with that with the small single moment uh, report we do have I think a struggle using bitcoins for that again just because of the translation issue but there's a there's a bigger question for um the company because their accounting is going to be different their corporate tax story is going to be is going to be a different story and so it becomes incredibly important to be able to nail down you know this is the transaction that occurred this is the when it occurred, and this was the you know value of the of the transaction. Um, this is what we did with the stuff afterward. You know, this is the we we have a Bitcoin stash. It's part of our cash reserves, or it's 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 part of our thing. Um, so just by virtue of being an entity, in, you know, that's registered in some state or another, they may have some additional accounting requirements around um, around effectively like managing the any kind of money, be it be a Bitcoin or otherwise. Um, but again, for the subscription model, I think that it's theoretically possible for that to make sense for somebody who's offering software as a service or for somebody who's offering developer services or things like that. Like, I think most of the people in this room are going to be somewhere in this, you know, whether you're just a person who's doing freelancing uh, or offering consulting services or whether you are part of a small company of developers that is doing stuff like this. I think this, this is probably the level that hits home. Um, the best example I have 
uh, well, one of the better examples is Namecheap, which recently started accepting uh, Bitcoin as payments for domain name registrations and subsequent management of those domain names. They seem to think that it's a somewhat of a win-win because it's already, you know, the folks who are interested in Bitcoin anyway tend to be open source enthusiasts or software developers or folks who are, you know, in that world in the first place. Um, and so it's not it's not unheard of for them to think I'm going you know we will attract more customers who want to pay this way if we if we utilize this this currency but then you just have to go back to that kind of you know what's the best practice if we are going to do that and I think what Namecheap must have decided is that it was worth the hassle of figuring out you know. How often do we find a conversion point? Like, do we change our prices every single day? Do we, you know, do we have this automated somehow? Like, what is the, what are the circumstances by which we, by which we create uh, a mechanism to make Bitcoin a payment option? Um, and then finally, we have SuperSaps, which is a consulting firm that specializes in everything, and they're huge, and they have offices in 10 cities, in London and Barcelona, and they charge millions of dollars and pounds and euros for their service, and they do, you know, they do stuff everywhere. They come in and they tell you all your analytics and your metrics and all this Six Sigma nonsense, and they tell you your critical path, and it's awesome, and you know. Um, ironically, or maybe not, uh, if I can editorialize a bit, you know, Bitcoin was produced to, to stick it to the man, in a sense. You know, I mean, it was created to say, why can't there be a currency that is just a direct, seamless transaction between two individuals who want to exchange value for thing or thing for value or whatever it is? And these guys actually have the systems in place to probably be the ones to best leverage Bitcoin as a payment system out of the gate. Because they're used to dealing in multiple currencies, they're used to handling complex situations where they have to deal with multiple jurisdictions just in their daily life when they report what they're doing or what their activities are. And they have a lot of person power and probably a fair number of lawyers like sort of stoking the fires and making sure that everything is, is as on the up and up and as current as it can possibly be. So from a risk management perspective, if they made the decision to jump into Bitcoin, they would probably be one of the people who would, you know, it would be like super simple, you know. And so I think the dilemma, if we can go back really briefly to the, to the smaller firm, is making sure that as these regulations start to crystallize, that the same spirit of open source that created Bitcoin in the first place also extends to conversations around how are you complying and why I think it's so cool that Bitcoin 2013 basically turned into Bitcoin compliance 2013 because there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done to figure out how to make this work for comparatively little per people as opposed to the people who are just going to throw some, you know, some human resources hours at it and figure it out. Um, so when we go back to our graph, there's a variety of places that you can land when you're when you're using Bitcoin. I don't think that it's I don't think that it's impossible, but I do think that um, that you do have to be uh, pretty careful about how you utilize it and whether it makes sense. Just because something is simple for a consumer to use doesn't necessarily mean that you have to offer it as a payment option. I had a long conversation a long time ago with a friend of mine who had finally switched to like an online, online invoicing system and it offered PayPal as a payment option. And he just didn't do it. He was like, you can, you know, I can, I can invoice you with this software and you can send me a check or you can use a credit card using this old traditional, you know, whatever it is, uh, the, oh, I just forgot the name of the huge gateway. Anyway, the, you know, the people who can, who can provide a virtual terminal for me to process your credit card. And I said, but PayPal does that for you. And it's, you know, it's this thing and it's simple and people are like eBay and all the stuff. And he was like, I, I don't care if it's easy or even if it's easier for, for my customers, which it, in a couple of cases it might have been, because I feel like I have a handle on this system. I receive checks and I can enter them in a ledger or I get the credit card payment statements and I understand exactly where those transactions have come from. I don't want to add a third thing. I don't want to, I don't, I, I just don't care. 
Um, again, if you're a user of Bitcoins, at the moment, you're, you're pretty okay. You know, I mean, if you start selling services or if you start doing things that, that make you look like a money transmitter as opposed to just a person with a specific kind of currency, I think, I think it's time to sort of start to think about it. But those are sort of the business basics. I apologize that got a little long and boring at the end. But um, <laughs> uh, who, anybody, questions, talk? Oh, my goodness, they're everywhere. All right, we'll start over here. Right. So the first question was, what does a traditional transaction look like in the eyes of the law? Um, so it depends on, on what you're talking about. You know, in the, the so in the before times, um, we can go all the way back to just plain old barter, right? Or like, you know, my, my favorite is the Elmo and Cookie Monster song. Like, you have cookies and I have milk. Like, let's, you know, there's a way to make this happen. Like, <laughs> let's, let's get together. So, so that notion of an exchange has, has persevered even as it's gotten more and more complicated. So when you're talking about, say, buying, you know, 200 thumb drives with your logo printed on them from a company in Utah, and they're going to ship here to Portland, and you're going to pay them money. There's a, a, a brilliant piece of code called the Univer Uniform Commercial Code, which was developed primarily by a guy named Carl Llewellyn, who is an absolute giant. Um, and, and if all he had ever done, although he did more things, but if all he had ever done is develop this, you know, sort of methodology by which goods and services could be exchanged across state lines, uh, then he would have he would have been a super winner. And uh, you know, at least in terms of America, that uh, that transaction is regulated by the UCC. So say, for example, the thumb drives arrived and they had the wrong logo on them, or they misspelled your logo, or they, not, you know, only half of them worked or something like that. And the UCC lines out some sort of automatic things that a buyer can do in those circumstances if the goods are non-conforming and all that kind of thing. Um, from a monetary transaction standpoint, the UCC is also the birthplace of what happens when I exchange this piece of paper that says I have money in a place and I want to give it to you and this is my, this is my proof and promise that I will. So what does a check do in the, in the world of commerce? How quickly does a bank have to respond or react to a check being deposited in their, um, you know, uh, you're, the, you're the guy who received the check so you go to your bank and deposit it. That bank talks to the bank that issued it and says, I need verification on this payment amount. And it used to all, this is how check kiting happened, right? Back in the day when checks got mailed back and forth and there was this length of time that banks had to verify the existence of the money or not, people could write a check to one account and then write the check back to the other account and then write the check back to the other account. And all, none of the deposits ever caught up with themselves until the guy or girl took the cash and, and, and ran. So the UCC governs that. It has different rules for like this kind of monetary payment and stuff like that. And then the, um, when we got into electronic transactions and electronic validation of that, along came things like the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act here in the US that um, specifies, all right, 
same deal only wire to wire as opposed to considering a negotiable instrument as the mechanism of payment. So um, how am I doing so far? What, is there other stuff? Yeah, I wasn't aware of that act, but that was yeah. what you were thinking of. You ate a 90, yeah. Eight, yeah. Yeah. Right around then, so it would have come out in the late 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you look at a PayPal or something like that, or a Wells Fargo, you know, like money by wire, this whole notion of, of being able to engage in those sorts of sort of procedures. You know, PayPal isn't strictly speaking a bank. I think at the end of the day they probably are regulated as a bank in addition because there are people who hold deposited funds in a PayPal account, and that's one of the central tenets of a definition of a bank. But, but anything that is a, an exchange of money machine is a money transmitter, and the, are covered by the UEDA, and then also the Bank Secrecy Act, which of course is sort of post-Patriot Act, like, tell us everything all the time, raw. I mean, I don't need to tell you guys right now that <laughs> the government is checking out a lot of stuff. Um, so it's, uh, it's it's uh, there's there are some pieces of it that are that are built into that as well. Um, internationally, there's um, UNCITRAL, right. the UN organization that looks at international business transactions and talks about their they've been looking a lot at uh, how do you whose law applies when you're dealing with something that goes over the internet or deals with websites and things like that. Right. So, So the other question was, a business in Canada with a server in Germany and a, and a client in Beijing who is actually traveling in Japan and sends a request via mobile to the Germany server, but it fails over to a server in Singapore. Uh, Canadian company. Yeah, with a Canadian company, yeah. Yeah, right. And, and where did that happen? Yeah. The... The easy answer is a oh. whole. Um, the right, exactly. So if you're, if you've, you know, from from the purposes of reporting to a locality, you know, so say uh, again another sort of dumb analogy, but I'm an insurance agent who is licensed to broker insurance in both the state of Oregon, the state of Washington, and Idaho, which is actually three. So all three of those states. And if I go into, if my principal base place of business is in Oregon, but we have a little satellite thing in, in Washington and I spend, you know, four days in Spokane selling policies to people and I come back, it's highly likely that I have created a taxable event in the state of Washington and I'm going to have to pay taxes in both states. And that's especially true of folks who are, um, uh, you know, who have kind of physical places of business that they would operate out of for that kind of thing. But uh, as um, Paula pointed out, from a, the perspective of something that's you know, purely virtu virtual, you have one headquarters, you know, the majority of your staff is there, you are you know, able to sell around the world, but all of the, all of the proceeds of the stuff are coming to, a single, coming to a single place and administered in a single place. That's, that's the home you know, for your intents and purposes tax-wise, that's the home of the, of the transaction. <laughs> right, yeah, and my recommendation would absolutely be to, to track that specific, you know, so that instance of sale, it's like, you know, you can keep the bitcoins, but immediately translate that transaction, you know, that, that transaction is recorded as an exchange for the value of X, you know, some other currency, preferably the local currency that you're going to have to pay taxes using. So a Canadian dollar or a US dollar, you know, and say, look a sale, you know. But then the, the sort of secondary question is, okay, so you've got a rolling store of Bitcoins, and it turns out it really was the Winklevoss twins, 
and they, you know, they launch this big media campaign and everybody's got to have Bitcoins and all of a sudden they're $500 a coin and you go, ha ha, there might be a second taxable event there when you, when you make that conversion from the, from the one to a different currency. And that's why securities, and I didn't mention this explicitly because so far nobody's really said much, but there are some securities regulation issues around virtual currencies um, in terms of like, well, so is this, is this an instrument? Like, is this, am I, am I trading in a commodity or am I, you know, can I, can I, one day will I be able to short Bitcoins or is there, you know, is there a way for me to, to, to hedge other currency worries by using this weird virtual currency? You know, and Linden dollars and WoW Gold really did sort of pave the way for people to start thinking really intensely about what does a virtual economy look like. And so Ed Castronova is a guy who's written a couple of books about about those virtual economies and and both the impact they've had and the and the the regulatory framework. Now, of course, with both of those, you have the end user license agreement, which probably says it's all illegal, right? I mean, from from the purposes of World of Warcraft, you're not supposed to be selling the Sword of Justice on eBay for real money or selling gold on eBay for real money, you know. But Unfortunately, and perhaps you know now it seems like everybody's like, "Look, we're the easiest one to sell on eBay." You know, like uh, that. That's becoming a selling point. How how fluid the ability to exchange, you know, game money into real money is, uh, is becoming its own little thing. And so that that really is what I think cracked open the door of people starting to try to think about how to handle this. And then Bitcoin is is really, you know, it's it's leveled up, um, because there isn't that. Again, there's no central authority. If the central authority is the game universe and the and the company that made the game, you still have somebody validating the the digital bits that are being exchanged. You know whether or not they want to do that, or whether it's you know within their terms of service to do that. That's another question. But but there is still that central authority. Whereas Bitcoin, just all a big circle. Okay, sorry. This one. Yeah. Daniel, go ahead. Uh, started a uh, startup to replicate that in real life with real money and is in operation. So, um, and I made some money through them. And it's like, that they're like, send, send us like your, your, you know, social security stuff and whatnot. So they're, and like, well, they, they might say that like online it's illegal, but you know, that's right, right, right. in real life. And it's like, oh, we have to follow all these uh, yeah, yeah. Where's my risk slide? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, from the slide that you had that was talking about moving currency out from the state, like I think that that's great, and I think that Bitcoin is really a cool idea to do things like that. But I'm worried that while we say, like, yeah, you still, you still have to report these things to the IRS, it might not be enforceable, and services, like all the different social services that we have as like a country, are something that I really like. like public schools and things like that. And if we're actually gonna to move towards a digital currency that takes away the, any accountability and any way to actually enforce uh, giving back to society, um, I'm worried that that doesn't exist in on Bitcoin right now. Would you agree with that? Or? Yeah, no, absolutely. The, um so I, I completely failed to fund a Kickstarter about, that was going to write a book or ask people to help, you know, create an anthology of, of sort of, because this is, I mean, it's, it's way bigger than, you know, thinking about the legal implications is fun. Thinking about the global implications is a bigger deal. And, and, you know, one of the things I wanted to see was like, hey, Felix Salmon or some really smart economist, what happens if, say, 20% of the U.S. economy goes completely virtual? and in a very real sense decouples from the dollar that we currently think of as money, right? And that's, you know, don't get me started on that rabbit hole, but you know, like this whole notion of money being worth anything is already sort of a joke, but the, um, the, the it's gonna have wide reaching implications, not just on other actual currencies, but yeah, also on, on social services and stuff like that. You know, the, the, Assumption that we can capture it all with the current stuff uh, that that everybody has to work with, regulation-wise, is probably pretty optimistic. You know, I do think that that you'll see some 
some loss. And there are definite criminal, app I mean, don't get me wrong, like, you know, just in the same way that it's, it's, you know, super useful to have lots of cash on hand to, you know, fund nefarious activities or whatever, you know, it's also super useful to have a virtual currency that is effectively untrackable. And, you know, the, you can register that an exchange happened, but you have no idea why or how or even who those people are if they're careful, you know, and so that's, yeah, there's definitely some some social implications that we have to that we have to address. And if we're you know worried about sort of the our current ability to fund social services and something that makes it easy to skirt uh, you know taxable events or at least to make taxable events look a little like they didn't happen, maybe uh, you know that's that's definitely an issue. Yeah. One minute left. Okay, we have time for probably one more question. I saw somebody. Yeah, I think, I, I you know, belt and suspenders, that is a capital gain, you know, because it's a it's a good that increased in value, and then you sold it for more than you got it for.